Welcome to the Education of a Financial Planner, where we look at the major concepts in financial planning through the lens of two quant investors who are learning the ropes of the planning process and how to help clients achieve their long-term goals. Learn along with us as experienced financial planner Matt Ziegler helps us understand the most important financial planning concepts that impact all of us and how we can apply them to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. In each episode, we will work through one major financial planning concept from the ground up and learn how we can apply it in the real world. From retirement to college savings to taxes to estate planning, we will cover a wide range of topics that apply to each of our everyday lives. We hope you will join us in our learning journey. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at the Lydia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. All right, guys, today we're going to continue the discussion on the different stages in retirement. So we've done early retirement, the prime retirement years, sort of when someone first enters retirement. And then today we're talking about retirement in someone's later years. And we're going to touch on topics, including withdrawal rates, spending habits, required minimum distributions, inherited IRAs, estate planning, um, healthcare related things, and um, also t- kind of talking about how people may pr- prioritize different experiences or things in their retirement and how to think about maybe the shifting of some expenses over time um, to different things. Maybe early in your retirement, it's more about experience. And then over time, it shifts to, you know, maybe healthcare related costs, for example, things like that. But um, we want to kind of sort of talk about these stages of retirement. So these episodes can hopefully be stacked on top of each other and people can kind of continue to learn from um, our experience and Matt's experience in dealing with um, retirees and investors. So maybe to start, let's start at sort of the 30,000 foot view. Um, Matt, what do you think are the key considerations for individuals later in their retirement years? Key considerations definitely start with every year just having a basic outline of what the cash flows look like. So we're talking about money in versus money out, plain and simple, because in later retirement, you probably have social security, you may or may not have a pension, you probably have required minimum distributions or RMDs, which I'm sure we'll talk about a lot today from the retirement account. All of these things are going to be counterbalancing each other. And the older we get, the more life changes we tend to have. And whether that's planning ahead for next year's family vacation to Italy or next year's get the hip replaced and don't go anywhere, planning for these things, the tax consequences of each and how we're spending down or spending a piece of our assets is a huge consideration. Later stage of requirement, you're looking at this stuff probably every single year with a professional. How do you think about retirement or withdrawal rates as people age? You know, obviously you have a plan at the beginning and then depending on the sequence of returns, which we talked about in an earlier episode, you know, that that probably dictates a lot of this. But how, how do you think about sort of adjusting people's spending as they get older based on the outcome they're actually getting sort of with their portfolio? Great question. And this is totally Goldilocks and the Three Bears territory here, where you've got your plan of how much we're going to spend. So I just gave the example of family trip to Italy versus I'm going to have my hip replaced. So you're kind of budgeting out a year to a few years in advance, and you have an idea of what your spend looks like, and also an idea of what the tax ramifications of that spend look like. So now what you're doing is in planning your withdrawal rates is you have a targeted, hopefully sustainable withdrawal rate that you've worked through with the professional. And now as markets ebb and flow, the accounts ebb and flow, you decide, can I afford to take out more? Do I need to take out more? Should I not take out more? Your asset allocation is going to help drive these decisions. And your balancing back to Goldilocks, is the porridge too hot? Is it too cold? Is it just right? And maybe if you have super good equity returns in one year, you're going, hey, not only can I pay for that family vacation to Italy, but I can set a little more aside. But if you have really dreadful returns too, hopefully you have enough safe assets in place to meet the RMD, big, big part of this, and pay for that hip replacement or whatever else or do the math. So withdrawal rates vary depending on your life and market cycles. Part of why you got to look at this probably once a year for most people at least. Is it common for you to have difficulty getting people to spend money? Like if, if they are getting this positive outcome and they have the ability to spend more money, 
I mean, is it tough convincing them to do that? Do people want to kind of hold on to money? People inherently, that shift from accumulation to decumulation or accumulation to spending money, that can be a hard mindset shift. So some people have a harder time with this than others. Some people just really like to spend money and that's a whole different issue for burning it. But this idea that you're going to have different segments or chapters or periods or eras in your retirement is really important in talking through this. Because we go back to that retirement puzzle we talked about before, where you usually need to plan on spending about 80% of your income, but most people still end up with like 50% of those assets when they pass away. So this balancing act of saying it's okay to spend money in retirement if you've got a thoughtful plan and a responsive plan in place is really important. How do you think about, you mentioned RMDs before. Can you just talk a little bit about what RMDs are, kind of when they start, like at a high level, what people need to know about RMD? So I think RMDs are required minimum distributions. And I think for, especially for younger or newer retirees, it's just important to remember this. So if you're at RMD age now, you know what they are. And if you're nowhere near RMD age, you're like, what the heck is this acronym? So history lesson, if we go back to the 70s and the creation of ERISA, which is basically the thing that gets created when we go from, remember those days when people used to get pensions? Why don't we have that anymore? Well, generically, we don't have pensions anymore because companies weren't always the best stewards of savings. And when companies go belly up, i.e. the inflation, the unemployment situation of the 70s, sometimes pensions go away. And if you worked at a company hoping they would pay you a pension and then the company and the pension goes away, that sucks. So 401ks get invented in this period. ERISA gets invented in this period. By the mid 80s, we're going, okay, instead of the company holding your money for you and promising you money in the future, now you own the money in your own account. And if the company goes belly up, it's protected by you and your name at your 401k. Well, what happens is now you, Justin, Matt, whoever, grandma has a balance in that IRA. And RMDs, required minimum distributions, exist because we didn't pay the money going into the plan. The IRS goes, you got to pay me the money someday. So they want to force you to start taking distributions so that they can collect their taxes. In a nutshell, that's why RMDs exist, to force you to pay taxes on money you put away and got tax deferred growth on for, in some cases, decades of time. There'll probably be listeners with a lot of different types of accounts, you know, whether it be 401ks, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, like which ones of those do RMDs apply to? So RMDs generically apply to, for, for just you, the individual who's been funding your own accounts. If the money went in pre-tax, IRA, individual retirement account, 401k and work, 403b, any variation on that, that the money went in pre-tax, at some point later in life, you're going to have to take RMDs because you didn't pay tax yet. You have to pay tax later. Your Roth options, your Roth 401k or your Roth retirement account, those ones you already paid tax. So they're not worried about forcing you to take required minimum distributions later. I'm sticking inside of your lifetime for this question, but that's the general rule. You know, what would be really neat is as because some clients, they take the, these RMDs, but they actually don't need the money. Like we have some clients that take the RMDs and then reinvest it back in the market into a taxable account. It would be neat if you, to the point we were talking about earlier, like it'd be neat if you could have like purpose-driven RMDs where a family would decide to use the RMDs to do something together as a family or like, I'm thinking like grandparents that are forced to take that, you know, if a grandparent has a multi-million dollar IRA and they have high RMDs, like it'd be cool to take the RMD and then say, you know what, we're going to do a family vacation together, or we're going to do something like purposeful that would, you know, rather than just sticking it and turning it right around, investing it in the market, do something that would be from an experience standpoint. I mean, I don't know that maybe that's sort of pie in the sky for some families, but I think that that's a kind of a neat idea. Go back to the, the goals-based planning episode we did and this, this underlying concept. If you're truly doing some version of goals-based or objective-based planning, you can say, we want IR, we, we don't need the RMDs for income. 
And if we don't need them for income, maybe we want to use them towards the family vacation. Maybe it's a distribution from the Roth account for the vacation. And at any time you have an above average year in returns or something, you can customize any of this stuff. And there's great charitable options. There's great family options that all exist. It's about just knowing the thing is coming, knowing what the consequences are, and then deciding, well, what's the purpose you want to attach to the thing? I think there's no one answer to this because it's changing with recent laws, but when, when do people typically have to start taking RMDs? So the old rule was 70 and a half. That got updated to 72. COVID happened. Everybody lost track. So let's just step in today. In 2023, if you're 73, you have to start taking money out of your retirement accounts. If, if the RMDs apply, obviously. That rule changes again. So we're at 73 now. We are jumping in 2033 up to 75. This is all part of the SECURE Act. It's relatively fluid in the law sense, but right now at 73, you have to start taking. In 2033, it jumps up to age 75. And how does the percentage work that you have to take out? I mean, do they look at your life expectancy and say, I want to drain the account by the end of your life expectancy? So that's the percentage? Is that how it works? Approximately, yes. So there's actuaries basically at the IRS and they're calculating these tables. What you can do, and we can put a link to this in the show notes, is you can go to the IRS website and you can see which tables apply to you. The key rules to know is for you and your situation, um, if your spouse is about the same age as you, it's a, it's a simple table and you want to look for the worksheet on the retirement on the IRS uh, retirement account RMD website. That's the easiest one to read for most people. It's a one pager with a table. If your spouse is more than 10 years away from you, uh, there's a separate table. So just be aware of it. And then for inherited accounts, there's a whole other way that may or may not apply depending on your situation. Don't try this at home, kids. That's the lesson here. But go to the IRS website, find the corresponding table. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take it's a snapshot of the value from the end of last year. So my 2023 RMD is based on the December 31st, 2022 value. And then the age that I'm turning in calendar year 2023. And what the table will tell you on the IRS worksheet is say, how old are you turning this year? Here is the divisor. Now take your balance from last year, apply the divisor. This is your RMD amount. Most likely your custodian or wherever you have your account will do this for you too. So don't get math anxiety. And how does it work with an inherited IRA? I assume the government's not going to stop wanting tax revenue just because someone dies. So they're going to probably still require you to get the money out of there. So how, how does that rule typically work? Inherited IRAs work differently at different levels. So first off, as Shawshank Redemption taught us, unlimited gifts between spouses, husband, wife, husband, husband, uh, spouse, spouse, whatever your marital relationship is. If you are married, then your spouse can take over your retirement account, Roth, IRA, whatever. So for them, the RMD is now going to shift to whatever age there are and whatever the situation is. Talk to a professional, but generically spouse just goes straight to the spouse, gets retitled in their name. Now, non-spousal beneficiaries or spouses that are more than 10 years younger uh, or with children, and we'll talk about them in a second too, and grandkids, all sorts of other rules apply. So generically speaking, right now under secure, the SECURE Act, if a non-spouse inherits your IRA, then they have to start taking distributions and empty the account out in a 10-year period. A little bit loose on the rules because these aren't hard and fast yet, but generically, it just says over the next 10 years, you have to liquidate the account. Now, if you died... 10 years ago, there's a totally different rule. It's called a stretch IRA that may apply to you. Don't panic unless somebody died in the last two years or so since this started coming to law where the 10-year rule applies. It gets more complicated, not to get into here, but why you need to talk to a professional when there's kids that are minors inheriting accounts. There's special rules if you have a disabled child who's inheriting an account. And that's where you really want a professional to understand the tax consequences and which RMD table applies to your unique non-spousal definition of who the beneficiary is. Are there any planning opportunities around that? I mean, I don't even know if this is even possible. Like, so for instance, if I'm older 
and I'm in a very low tax bracket and my kids are in very high tax brackets. Like, do I want to be doing like Roth conversions or something in the, late in my life to try to pay the tax now? Is there anything like that that you typically do? Yes. And how, how much of planning and, and investing just boils down to tax arbitrage, right? <laughs> so, so, so yes. And I'll give you the example it is like you have a client and they're in their eighties and they're basically in a nursing facility or something and they just, they have their healthcare expense, but then that's it. They're not going out to dinner anymore. Life is not particularly fun, but as such, their income's also really low. And now let's just say that client in their 80s has adult children who are in their late 50s, maybe. And they're like at peak earnings where they're thinking of retiring in five or 10 years. But if they get that inherited IRA right now and they have to start taking money, even with the 10 year window and all the rules we just discussed, like they're like, my tax rate sucks. Mom's or dad's tax rate is good. And the family conversation about how do we want this IRA to pass generations comes onto the table. So it might be, mom, start doing Roth IRA conversions so that when it comes to the kids, the kids inherit it, but they inherit it with the taxes already paid at the lower rate. That can work. And we also get into charitable strategies and other things that can be done too to play this tax arbitrage game. Always, always, always incumbent on understanding that calendar of cash flow crap or balance sheet where we say, what's the purpose for this? Is this sustainable? And now what are ways we can optimize around what you or what the client really wants? On our other podcast, we have this series we called Show Us Your Portfolio, where we talk to like great investors and we talk about how they manage their own portfolio. And one of the things we always talk to them about is this idea of giving money to their kids, because to some degree, it's a double-edged sword. You know, giving too much money to your kids might make them not accomplish what they could in life. But on the other hand, you want to give as much as possible to your kids. And I'm just wondering, like from where you sit at the table, like how often do you play a role in that conversation in terms of thinking about like how much money somebody should give to their kids and and how they think about that process? We talk about this all the time. It, it gets really interesting with family office clients where we're talking about not just about money. It's like, what values do you want to give to the kids is where it gets repackaged. Another way that I love to repackage it of not just giving money to kids, but how do you give the right financial values to your kids and non-financial values for that matter too. It's like, instead of giving money to the kids, what if we reframe this as taking money from the parents? Like how do we want to think about this realistically here? Um, so within this, in terms of retirement accounts, obviously if mom and dad take money out of the retirement account, they have, in many cases, they have to pay taxes and pass it on. So we go, okay, would we rather have them inherit the IRA and then have to follow this 10 year rule? And if they do, it can also be just part of the planning conversation between families. So if mom and dad have a ton of money in retirement accounts and they know their kids are going to inherit it, but at the tax consequence for the kids, it's going, okay, how do we want this to come to you? And if we want this to come to you, is the 10 year window enough? Are you going to retire and you can defer this to afterwards? And is this okay? Um, is there a mortgage that the kids want to pay off? Is there a better way to get them this money? Should we use life insurance instead of the IRAs to go to the kids? And we'll point the IRAs at charitable organizations. Kids can have the life insurance money tax-free. IRAs can go to the charity. Now we've directed it away from Uncle Sam, but we just have better choice on what's the meaning, what's the purpose behind these dollars. One of the biggest probably costs for people later on in their life is healthcare related sort of expenses. And I'm wondering that, like, how do you think a financial advisor sort of can help um, someone, you know, with that? Um, is it just, you know, planning for a certain amount of maybe healthcare expenses? Is it, you know, having this money that's safe over here to cover health? Because obviously you don't know what can happen. I mean, as we all get older and we age, there's obviously a lot of healthcare related things that can go on and those expenses can go up. So what do you, how do you approach that with people you work with? So when it comes to healthcare and retirement, this goes back to that annual blocking and tackling exercise. So health surprises are always one thing and you want to make sure you have money set aside for health surprises. And let me back up one other second too. Most people are going to go on Medicare at 65. And if healthcare expenses are a significant part of your annual outlay, then understanding both your Medicare premiums and what's covered, you know, all of your different coverages is really important. And knowing what your health risks are that are the obvious risks. Beyond that, 
you want to have part of your healthcare budget, just like you have your home budget. So for people that own the house, knowing you will have maintenance, maintenance expenses over time. And once in a while, you have to replace the roof and stuff like that. With health, it's, you might have to replace your teeth or get a new shoulder or, uh, you know, have, have a weird surgery for something removed on your foot. These are all real expenses that I've had clients need to take out in the last year. They're not normal, even though we kind of freak out when they're coming. So the understanding what your likely outlays are and then planning for them and adjusting every single year, that's the single most important determinant. One footnote on the Medicare piece too, that's something people forget. If you are on Medicare and at the significant part of how you pay for it, your income is thinner, there's not a lot of extra income to go around. No, if you pull extra money out, it's going to be recognized as income, like from RMDs or retirement accounts, and that can upset your Medicare premiums, uh, including you sell a second piece of property, something like that. People overlook that. That's a, at the danger point where, again, now somebody reviewing this once a year, they're going to sidestep a lot of landmines on top of what is already the landmine of what happens if you get really sick. No, that's a very good point. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, estate tax in another episode, but just generally, can you talk about the levels of someone's estate where this becomes kind of an issue that people try to, you know, avoid, I guess if possible. De definitely. And these luckily, luckily also called the death tax get indexed for inflation pretty much every year. So we're up to about 13 million at the federal level. For an individual, so about 26 million at uh, the couple's level. So once your assets are getting up into that, you know, 13 million plus range, you need to be talking to a financial planner and likely an estate attorney on what your strategy is for this. Retirement account, uh, equity in the house, all this stuff is basically getting lumped into the value of your estate. So you want to know what that is. Further, I can't stress this enough. Know if your state that you live in apply tax at the time of death and how those rules work. So Connecticut, do you guys know what Connecticut is? I think Connecticut's like nine-ish million or something like that. Now. I think it was even less than that. Yeah, that was something when I did, I did the estate planning a while back and that was something I didn't realize. Like I, I didn't realize there was a much lower limit for Connecticut than there was, you know, for the federal. So case in point, your state might be way less than federal and Case in point, like for Mass, a lot of clients in Massachusetts for us, um, math is quirky. Math is a million dollar state tax threshold, and it's a funky little progressive calculation where if you die with $999,000, you don't owe anything. But if you owe $1 million and a penny, now you owe stuff. And every state has their own rules. So your, cap, your, your stuff is going to count. First step, know what your state rules are. Second step, know where you are against the federal rules. And then like third step, devise a plan for passing the assets on thoughtfully. Because once you get above those like $26 million as a couple or 13 as an individual at the federal level, I mean, we're talking like 40% on every extra million dollars you're on over. So for our ultra high net worth clients and stuff, I mean, that's 400,000 plus dollars of every million dollars is going straight to Uncle Sam. That's a pretty strong incentive to go do some planning. From your experience, how do people think about charitable giving in their later years? Um, you know, our clients typically aren't doing a lot of charitable stuff with their investments with us, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen it more. So how do people kind of view it and, and what have you seen? So I'm going to tie this right back to the retirement accounts and like RMDs, but this is really important. There's, there's a lot of different ways to get retirement account assets that are going to get paid. Uh, so we're talking about the pre-tax stuff specifically, where when it comes to you, the individual, you're going to pay income tax on that distribution. So there are some great charitable strategies for basically reducing that, especially, especially if you're in a case where you don't need all the money, or maybe you're giving a little bit of money to charities every single year. There's, there's a newer, newer rule called Qualified Charitable Distributions, or QCD, and it applies to your RMDs, so alphabet soup here. The QCD, or the Qualified Charitable Distribution Rules, basically say you can go to your advisor or your custodian, and I'll give like the two 
two most common examples. Say somebody has a $10,000 RMD and they give $5,000 to charity every single year anyway. They can come to their advisor and go, hey, take that $5,000 and give it straight to the United Way. And this is the critical part. It has to go straight in the name of the charity from your custodian, your advisor can help you with this, to the charity. And if you do that, no income tax. Now the perks on doing that versus just writing it out of your checkbook, is this a great way to just like pull it straight out of your income tax and say, this qualifies as one of those QCDs and went straight to the charity. Likewise, if you want to do your entire RMD to charity, we help clients do this via the QCD or in the death scenario. So I die, I want my money go to, the, to go to the charity. Well, the charity is not going to pay income tax. And I'll oversimplify it for a second. So retirement assets being passed to charities can also be a really great way where, back to the example I gave before, I might have life insurance that gives my kids a death benefit and I might have my retirement accounts going to a charity. My kids get the life insurance death benefit tax-free. The charity gets my retirement accounts, which otherwise my kids would have gotten taxed on and they get that tax-free. All a planning exercise, but there's more flexibility, especially with charities than people may realize. So we've talked about a lot of different things. I think the biggest, probably most important takeaway is, you know, even later in retirement, there's all these different decisions and or events that happen where because of those changes, it's important for investors to be thinking about those things and individuals to be thinking about those things, but also working with their financial advisor, because as we've touched on here, there's a lot of complexity. I mean, the RMDs, the healthcare related expenses, the different types of that point about the charitable giving you just made, Matt, which is excellent. Estate taxes for people that are, you know, in those levels. I mean, um, there's just, you know, every single retirement episode we've done, I think we could have probably talked a lot more because there's so many important details um, that people need to think about, which is why it's important to sort of, you know, in, be engaged with a financial professional to talk through some of this stuff. So hopefully this episode was helpful for those people that watched it. And if you have any, uh, I guess, follow-up questions or anything else you'd like us to talk about, let us know. We'll, we'll be happy to do that in future podcasts. And thank you guys for listening. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.